Yeah, good day, brother and sister. I invite all of us to open our Bible. And we will read together from the verses that we have read previously. From 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, uh, verse 13 till 21. First John chapter 4, verse 13 till 21. We will read in turn, and I will read the, yeah, the odd verses, and I invite brother and sister to read the even verses. We will read from verse 13 till 21. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Verse 14. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, all, so also are we in this world. We love because he first loved us. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that we may gather together today that we can pray for you and we can sing song to praise you. And now we also want to listen to your word. We pray that you may help us, Lord, that we may understand your word that we may have a humble heart, an open heart, an open mind, that we may receive and believe your word, because we believe that you are Father, our Father who art in heaven, who love us and who care for us. We believe that by doing your word, by believing your word, it will, will help us to know how to be your son and we will we can know how to live according to the image of your only son Jesus Christ we pray this and we also pray that may the Holy Spirit help us enlighten us through all this and we also interpret what your servant will say uh, interpreting in in our life is one of us as we have our own struggle and we pray this in Jesus name Amen as we see this uh, verse that we read, we can see that it is interesting that in the beginning, uh, well, not very beginning, but the first 13 till 16 or maybe 16a, we can see that it points about uh, saying that by this we know that we abide, in, we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So the idea of abiding here, that we abide in God and God also abide in us. And this can only be done by the work of the Holy Spirit. Believers are abide in God and God abide in us. And the, the, the wording here uh, in, in English is also quite clear that the abiding means it, it has connotation of something permanent. The relationship between us and God is not something like uh, today maybe God loves us and then tomorrow he changes his mind and then he doesn't love us anymore and that kind of thing. But the idea of abiding is something stay. It is permanent and this is usually that's why in Reformed Theology we understand that uh, our, we cannot lose our salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. Why? It's not because we are good enough or our 
faith is strong enough and so on, but because the abiding of God. Because God stays in His commitment, His willingness to help us even when we uh, get deter or deviate from, from the path, He will strengthen us and He will draw us back to return to Him. And this is something we understand this because He abides in us and we also abide in Him. And this, uh, especially when put the Spirit here, we understand that the Spirit is the uh, is the one uh, of, uh, or we can say the person, the Holy Spirit is, of course, the third person of the Trinity, is the one who keep us through all this process. So we can understand that's why in, uh, of course, we understand in, as also in reform theology that we should strive, we should persevere, we should be faithful to God, but it's not something that from our own strength, but because the Spirit strengthening us and help us through all this. And we believe that He is willing to stay with us through all the difficulties. And even though sometimes we also neglecting what we, uh, we, are, we should do, the Spirit will remind us. He remind us again about His Word and everything and will uh, keep us uh, on the track and that kind of thing. And this is something then, the result of this, as we follow in this sentence, the result of this abiding or bonding in here is about believing and knowing Jesus. It's interesting as maybe when we read this, or maybe when we think about how we, God abides in us and we also abide in God, maybe uh, we have a sense of idea sometimes of someone doing meditation and it's something like, oh, really, have a calm or whatever in there. <laughs> spiritual, uh, physical, whatever happened in there, mystical maybe. But in here it points that the result is about we, so that we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And also uh, confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God, again this language repeated, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, and so on. So the idea... Uh, of if, I, if I want to put this way, how do we know that we really abide in God and God abide in us is that we can believe and know in Jesus. Interesting in this way because sometimes we think it's the other way around. We, what I mean is sometimes we think, oh, I start believe and knowing uh, Jesus, yeah, I grow in understanding, I know, okay, who is Jesus and what he has done and everything. The doctrine and the theology, and then we think if I grow in such maturity, and then I will reach this so, sort of level, sort of uh, maturity, spiritual maturity that God abides in me and I in God. But we see in here in this text and also another text, it points the other way around. That it starts with God who want to abide in us and we in Him. Of course, here maybe as it first. But it is the act of God first. He is the one who initiated this act and he wants to abide and stay with us. And the result of this, and then we can eventually believe and know. The continuation of, or the effect of this abide. And this is something we uh, should understand because again, sometimes, at, at, or at least if I want to put that way, in the phenomenal, in the phenomenology or in the phenomena in our day, in our experience, we might think the other way around. I think, okay, I start believe in Jesus and then I should grow in such a way that I have this abiding. But actually, when we can believe Jesus and we, I mean, believe in the biblical Jesus in how Jesus was presented in the gospel, not according to our own imagination whatsoever, we should understand that this is, this is the result and this is the proof that God already worked in our life. That God will open our mind, open our heart, that we may believe as He is. As He is presenting Himself, of course, in the Bible and everything. And this is something we should remember this. Again, every time we believe and think for most of us, or all of us here, we believe and know in Jesus. We understand that it is actually the proof that God has already given His grace in our life that He wants to stay with us and He 
give his blessing in our life in this. We should not take it for granted. And this is something we should understand that we need to grow in believing him and knowing Jesus. And of course, and we understand him correctly according to what he has said in the Bible. This is also an act of uh, act of God in, in our life. And it continues in this uh, matter, not just talking about the, the correct understanding, of course, and there is a context in the letter of John because he is also opposing the, the heresy. Quite interesting to think that the heresy during John's uh, Apostle John time, or in this letter, is about the people who don't believe Jesus is actually come in flesh. Jesus is kind of like just manifested in such a way, but he's not truly have a flesh and body. Isn't it interesting? I think the other way around, people just thinking, oh, Jesus is, yeah, just a man, but he's not God. But <laughs> in during Apostle John life and in this letter, we can see that it's the other way around. People believe, okay, he is God, but he cannot become a man, and that's kind of thing then. But, uh, that's... Uh, Important to recognize that there is a shifting in the history sometimes. But then I can I will continue here since I think basically we don't have this kind of problem, docetism. But then knowing Jesus correctly, believing in him correctly, is about we grow in his love. That we may understand his love in us because that's what the, in this verse say. That we come have, uh, we, uh, in verse 16, as we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Again, uh, repeating this same terminology about the abiding that God in us and we in, we in God, it's again a point about the permanency of the relationship between us and God. And uh, in this verse, it's continue about, that's why uh, by this love, um, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment as uh, because as he is also are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear and so on sometimes when we understand this uh, first we may think oh okay this talking about love contra fear contra punishment so if we truly love God there is no punishment and we should just forget about punishment and whatever but sometimes that kind of notion is uh, misunderstanding what is the whole uh, passage of the Bible and of course even in this letter. Because again, as I have mentioned earlier, that actually Apostle John even opposed the heretic, the wrong understanding of God, right? Simply because it's wrong. Yeah, simply it's wrong. So the, and there is that notion uh, correcting in that sense. So the love in here is not something, oh, you, we just accept whatever and wherever that is, but there is already the notion of correcting in the previous uh, passage about this. But then about the punishment here, because when we truly understand the love of God and we truly believe and knowing who Jesus is, we cannot separate it with the fact that what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, right? What Jesus accomplished on the cross is not something, oh, we see how Jesus is so good, so uh, do everything uh, so good and well, but the people, the Jews especially, oh, they hate him, they are, uh, they are jealous of him, and that's why they crucify, crucify him and so on. But the idea is because what Jesus accomplished, again, it is accomplished on the cross, is that he paid the penalty of our sin on the cross. This is what we believe. That's why I think in some sense, if some people think, oh, reading the gospel make us hate the Jews. No, we should understand that's not the message of the gospel. Why Jesus on the cross? It's because my sin. It's because he paid for my sin. Yeah, his people. Not that other people that we may think, oh, they didn't believe in and so on. No, he died for his people. And this is something, again, the correct understanding of Jesus, we should understand this. And that's why, we are not afraid anymore about the punishment. You can see the correlation here. Because the punishment here, it doesn't, not, it doesn't present as something, oh, you should forget about anything about law or punishment, judgment, or oh, whatever, that's bad and that's, you don't have to think about. 
But we should remember why we should not have fear because Jesus has paid it already. And we have confidence here because we trust on what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. That's the basis of our confidence here. So this is not about people having like, um, you know, a strong character. I have uh, confidence. I can do this and that. I'm not afraid and that kind of thing. And contra to maybe some people are more shy away and hard to have confidence. It's not talking about that. We have here why we should have confidence, not because our own strong character or whatever, uh, extrovert or introvert, whatever, but it's because we believe and we trust what Jesus has done and it's already paid enough. We believe what he has done. Again, it derives from we understand and believe what Jesus has done. Knowing Jesus correctly according to our Bible, not according to our imagination or whatever, but according to what he has done, and that's why we can love him. Because he has also first loved us. And this is the fact of, uh, this is the idea of the love of God here. Yeah. This is the, what we, are, when we, uh, or, or if I want to put in another way, sometimes uh, I met some people say, oh, I didn't really want to understand about Bible or something. Oh, but I believe something. I believe that God loves me and I love him. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. Maybe to some point, yeah, that's, that's good enough. But um, maybe we should also be cautious that maybe that's only an idea in our own life. Not, that's just our, our imagination. Do you get what I mean? Oh, I love God and love God love me. Oh, that's all. I don't need to think about any other things because whatever, God loves me and I love him anyway, that's all. But if we understand that we cannot separate love with knowledge, at least a certain amount of knowledge, we understand that the true love also grow in knowledge, in knowing whom or the person whom we love and also the person whom who love us, right? Otherwise, it's, it's just abstract or maybe just um, our own imagination here. And here we understand, if we truly understand what, uh, what is the love of God here, it's about what Jesus has done. And this is something growth in our life, not because, like I mentioned earlier, not because of our diligence or, I don't know, our intelligence, whatever, or we are more receptive to or have more interest in the spiritual things and whatever, but it's because God abides in us and we abide in Him. You understand here? There is a correlation here because who, if I want to put in such a way, whom God loves, He will make Himself known to that person. Simple, right? And <laughs> this actually basically also happened in our life, right? The, the, the person that we love and even... And, of course, especially he or she reciprocate with our life, uh, with our love, and he or she also love us. We will make ourselves known to him or her, right? So this is very basic. When we understand we how to grow in love, uh, the love of God, we will know him better. Grow little by little. Some some people grow, uh, let's say, slower. Some pe people seems faster or whatever, but it will grow because. The, the, or assurance, if I want to put in that way, because God is the one who wants to abide in us. So he's the one who will make sure this, that this love and this growth also, uh, the, sorry, this love and also this uh, knowing of God also grow in our life. Because he's the one who assured that happen in our life. And then we continue that, uh, it's interesting, this is sometimes a uh, quote, in verse 19 as a, a dictum or a slogan. We love because he first loved us, right? It's also a beautiful verse here, of course. We love because he first loved us. But I want to talk a bit here. This is, a, a, this is about the basis of Christian love. First, we accept that the fact that we are loved by God. It's, it's quite clear here. It's passive. Passive in sentence doesn't mean we have to be passive and about uh, connoting that we didn't do anything. But it's about we are the one who get receive that love first. Hence, this is the basis, the foundation, and the model so that we can love other person. 
And this is something we should always remember that the idea of Christian love is not something, uh, you know, it's not something like uh, come from our inner being or something like that, that I just exercise in such a way that I can love others because I'm growing in God's love and whatever. But the foundation is because God has loved us first. And maybe if I want to put in such a manner, sometimes when we struggle how to grow in God's love, maybe we should understand this, uh, the first part of the sentence first. Eh, sorry, uh, the second part of the, of the first. That because he first loved us. Can we accept the fact that we are loved by God? Truly. That we are loved by God and also, of course, imply that we need that love of God. This is very simple again. I think uh, usually people also, oh yeah, of course, we also like the idea that God loves us, but what kind of love that is shown? And it is actually apparent and clear it was written in the Bible, the kind of love that is shown to us. And we should start from here first. I think this is also interesting since um, there are sometimes uh, the, the, the study in the psychology, of course, it's psychology, not theology. We can take it with the grain and soil and whatever. But sometimes uh, there is a saying that, what is the problem of humanity? What is the social or mental problem? Is uh, this thing that he lack of love. Because uh, especially for someone who have a trauma in their, uh, when they are still uh, children or something, they didn't get or receive enough love from the parents. And that's why, that because of that traumatic experience, it affects how he, he or she acts later on when he or she gets adults in adult's life and everything. Because he doesn't get enough care, doesn't get enough love. And yeah, of course, there are other things, issues that we need to tackle when we face that, that kind of difficulties. But this is something that I believe uh, is kind of like remedy in here, if we understand this. That first, God loved us. And how he expressed his love is not something abstract. He also pointed in the history and what Jesus has done. And this is something we need to remember this. Or if I want to put in the way, in another way, it's not always about how we should love others, but can we accept that we are loved, we are loved by others? Yeah. You know, maybe there are some here uh, who are still single looking for for a girlfriend or boyfriend, that's something that you can also consider, not just about, oh, I love him and he, how to find someone who accept my love. But maybe if you want to put another way, another way around, you can think about, uh, is there someone that his, his or her love that I can accept? And sometimes these difficulties happen, especially for the mother people, the bridge, uh, <laughs> the stumbling block here is the arrogance of uh, modern people that think I can be independent. I don't need the care for others. And also this is something, uh, yeah, again, I want to point it back in how we relate to God, how we truly understand that, yeah, God loves us and we enjoy and we uh, feel fulfillment through God's love in our life. And that's something that's really uh, beneficial and that's something really we cherish in our life as we accept this fact. And this is the foundation and the model to later on express the love to other person. And of course, to return the love to God himself. And this love, if uh, I want to continue here a bit about what is the idea of biblical love or agape love, sometimes uh, other person put it in here. We should remember that the description of love in the Bible, it is not merely a feeling or short circuit of emotion, but it is loyal, sacrificial, and beneficial for others, if I want to put it in a short way. Because the, the idea of uh, love here is not something, oh, okay, I feel uh, flattery, oh, I feel like just an emotion and short circuit of emotion here. Because that kind of love is not something lasting, right? It can change. Even we can like love someone today, and then maybe next month, it will be changed. We don't love him anymore or we hate even him, <laughs> left him, even hate him or hate her anyway. But we can see the, the idea that the love that God explained in this passage 
especially when he said God is love, we understand that God is not like some emotion that go up and down that way, but he is loyal. Means he is faithful. He stay. Um, yeah, I will explain this. Loyal, sacrificial, and beneficial for others. If I want to uh, take in a simple, uh, yeah, quite simple and concrete uh, way, we can see is actually uh, in the in how a parents, uh, yeah, the parents love their children or child, of course, for that matter. It is loyal, right? Sometimes when we want to take care of our children, they didn't accept it well for whatever reason. But we do it anyway. It's loyal, right? Uh, if I want to put it a bit blunt on here, sometimes when I change the diaper of my son, I don't like it either. But I do it anyway. Or do you expect me to, oh, here's my son. Oh, I found your diaper. Oh, and then you pee again. Pee at me. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so uh, cherished. No, but I do it anyway. You see what I mean here? It's not really emotionally pleasing in such a way. But it's loyal. Why? Because he needs it. I do it anyway. Not because I like this like here, but I do it anyway. Why? Simple, because he's my son. Right? So this is like the idea of uh, loyal here. This is also how we understand that. How, uh, as sometimes I also talk to my wife, when we understand, ah, it's hard to raise up children and everything. We should remember, actually, this is already what our parents have done in our life, right? And we can appreciate them much later in this way. But we can also see this is how also God uh, treat us. He taking care of us. Even though sometimes we <laughs> didn't really, um, how to put it, <laughs> didn't re return it in a good way. But he's loyal. He's loyal. And even it is sacrificial love. It, it's sacrificial love because as we understand this, God didn't, uh, as we remember in John 3, 16, it's a very famous verse, right? For God so loved the word that he sent his son, his only son, even, so that whoever believe in him, whoever believe in him uh, shall not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't mean that, oh, he just sent his son and just walking around, having a lux uh, leisure, walking around there for several years and then return. No, it is a sacrificial. Because we understand, again, it's connecting to the accomplishment of Jesus' mission. And his mission is to die on the cross. That's why the idea of God's love here, or biblical love here, is always there is a notion of sacrificial. Yeah, maybe like what I explained about how the father changed uh, the diaper of his son. It's also a sacrificial, right? Yeah, taking care of that. Or is there someone here who wants to volunteer? Oh, I like to do it. <laughs> Every time, even in the middle of the night, I want to get up and everything. It, no, no, we understand it is a, a form of sacrificial. Or maybe if I, want, uh, if I want to put in different way, I remember there is a meme, you know, in, uh, the meme in internet sub, several years ago I saw, uh, saying how people usually uh, do in their free time. Okay, it's quite simple, meme. <laughs> and in that meme, it just shown what what uh, people do in their uh, for their free time, for the twenties, I mean for people who are in twenty year old or something, what they do in free time? Oh, party, having a party, go together with their friends. Oh, we want to go there. Oh, there is a festival. Oh, I want to go there and that kind of thing. But then what? And then the meme continues. And then uh, what do people in their in their thirties do if they have free time? Oh, I just want to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you in, uh, invite me to party? Oh, sorry. Now I have free time. Means I can sleep more. <laughs> so every people on 30s, oh, what is <laughs> what you will do in the free time? Oh, I just want to sleep. I just want to sleep and that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. It's just a meme, not a Bible anyway. But I think we can also see that. So what happened for the people who are 20s when they have children? A very small thing that they sacrifice is their time to go to that party. They sacrifice their time that they can hang out with their friends in their 20s. But for the people in their 30s, according to this meme, then what kind of sacrificial there? Yeah, diminishing of their sleep time. 
you see, it's just small thing, but that's also sacrificial in that way. Because you, can, you know, you, you, uh, you enjoy this, but you sacrifice this. You love this, but you are willing to sacrifice this for the benefit of others. And that's what I want to continue, for the beneficial for others. When we do the, uh, the, the idea in, the, in biblical love here, as we understand from these passages and other passages, it's always talking, it, was, it was always talking for the benefit of the people. I mean, for the benefit of uh, his people, right? I want to put in maybe in different way like this. Sometimes there are sometimes some people think, well, God love us, and then we should also return his love by loving him and glorifying him and so on. And then people ask, why it seems like transactional? Well, it's not transactional if, if we understand it is mutual anyway. If it is mutual, it's not transactional. Another thing we should remember that what God has done in our life, we cannot pay it back. Right? What God has done is giving his son died on the cross. No matter what we do in our life, no matter what we sacrifice for him, it will not even <laughs> reach the same equal price, if I want to put that way, transaction with God, what God has done in our life. In that way, we can understand this, and again, it's not meant to be a measurement, so you see, <laughs> what I have done is much bigger than you, so whatever you do, you cannot do on the same level with me. No, no, no. But we understand that because the concern and the focus of God, it is for our benefit here. That's the act of love. For benefit of the people or the person whom the, the, whom the love has given. Not for the benefit of the person who uh, show and act the love itself. And this is something we should understand because this is the idea of the biblical love here. And sometimes we um, quite easy here find it, uh, it is also uh, different with what has been uh, presented or what has been uh, think by the word because yeah, by the word uh, meaning, uh, if I want to put that way, Love is not a loyal thing. It's just a feeling, right? Now I love you, but next month, if I don't love you anymore, okay, bye-bye. It's not about loyal thing. It's about how I feel. And of course, it's not about sacrificial. I sacrifice myself. No. Why I love you? Because it benefits me, actually. Or if I want to put it in another way, sometimes, actually, it is the object who get love is the one who should sacrifice him or herself for benefit of the one who acts or using, uh, having that manipulative word as love. But that's why uh, the biblical understanding of love is different from the word, and we understand this. This is what God has shown us to us. And as we continue, and yeah, this is something we should remember this. This is agape love. This is the biblical love that was teached in the Bible and not follow according to what the word has uh, shown in our life. And at the end of the passage, it, it also correlates about the love of God and to love others, right? Um, I, this idea about the love of God and to love others, uh, I want to tackle first about the aspect of the commandment, yeah, as we see in the, in the, at the end of the verse 21. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I will to talk first... Uh, because to love God and to love others, again, is not a slogan. It is a commandment from God. And how we should understand the commandment or the law in here? First, we should remember that the law is important so that we know how to live. So the rule or the law here is not something we just need to remember. But, uh, yeah, of course, it's important to remember. But uh, the goal or the purpose of it, so, so that we know how to live. Or if I want to put in different way, let's say for, or let's say we want to play chess and we want to learn how to play chess. For us, when we learn this, the rule of playing chess, it's just about we remember. Okay, this uh, this peon uh, in the shape of horse, or oh, he can move in such a way, or maybe that peon, uh, that other peon can go, uh, let's say, two blocks at first, but then later on only one block. But that's not, uh, 
that's something from the perspective of the person who just started learn, learning how to play chess. But for the chess player, they didn't do it uh, for the sake of just remember the rule. But they 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 believe uh, they they think that the rule is important so that they can play the chess exactly, right? If you ask the chess player why the rule is important, yeah, because otherwise I cannot play the chess. So you see, in, from the perspective for the people who really, of course, he remember or she remembers how to move this peon and that peon, but it's not about how I exactly I remember the possibility of this kind of movement and that kind of movement, but so then I can play the chess. And this is something because this is also when we understand the law, uh, the law or the rule of God is meant so that uh, the purpose is that so that we can live in this world according to His way. And there's a big arena there that we can play around, if I want to put that way. And the law of God, also we should remember as we study and learning about the law of God, it is also the reflection of his character. Right? So that's why when we understand that, uh, especially maybe, yeah, yeah, to be fair, learning uh, the, the law of God is, takes longer than learning the rule of playing chess, let's say. And maybe let's say in during that time we find difficulties in how to really comprehend and understand why there is a certain law and that kind of law, this kind, this bo uh, boundaries here and there. But we should remember that even though in that moment, in that difficult moment, we should remember that this law is good. Why? Because God is good. The law is the expression of his character. If we, when we, we believe, and of course we understand God is good, God is love, God is justice, God is uh, truth, and so on. So also his law. The character of God is shown through his law. So even though we didn't really, uh, we didn't uh, directly can really understand it, well, we can start by believing it. Yeah, that's also very typical also, uh, um, yeah, what in the reform teaching, believe in order, we believe in order to understand. I believe in order to understand, so I start believe first. I start, I start by uh, receive it first, that this law must be good. This law must be uh, beneficial. It must be lovely. It, it's, it is justice. It is important and so on. Why? Because God is the one who command this law. But then through, through, through the, the process and in my life as I grow on, and then I will try to understand what, how to see this as a good thing, how to see this law as a lovely thing, how to see this as a truth and a beauty and so on about his character. This is something that as we grow in understanding to understand God's law, but it's there. Again, it's there. God didn't give us law like just shut up your mouth and just follow it, whatever. No, there is an expression, there is an understanding here. And if we want, are we and willing to take time to really learn about it, we can understand why he commanded it such a way. Okay, and I continue. So this is something we should understand every time we uh, have struggle in obeying God's law. And then these two things about loving God and loving others. Um... As we understand, it is also what has been uh, said by Jesus during his time in the gospel when he was asked, what is the most important commandment? And then he said, the first thing is about love God and the second one is loving others. But then sometimes people misunderstood it in such a way, oh, okay, love of God is number one and then this is number two. So kind of like secondary or not important thing. But actually as we understand it in the what Jesus meant actually, and also much, much more clearer here, it is connecting with each other. So uh, in this passage, it is saying that you cannot say that you love God and hate your brother, yeah? Because if he does not love his brother whom he has seen, uh, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So we can see here the love of God and the love of others, the love, uh, 
to love others, it is connecting in such a way. I believe in this matter we should understand because the, the love of God or to be loved by God is not an abstract, it's not an abstract thing. If someone claims, oh yeah, I was loved by God, I understand this. That's what uh, Hikaris Leo taught today. Oh, and I also love God. That's also what I believe. That's what I'm doing. It's not an abstract thing. Because it should be shown in such a way that it's realistic and concrete love by loving others. By loving the brothers that we see. So this is something we should understand. This And, and of course, there is a, in this part of this passage, if we struggle on this, Maybe uh, let's say we have struggled. Okay, I, I already accept the love of God and I know what I'm doing is actually to love God in all my ministry or whatever I'm doing. But it's hard for me to love others. And then this is part that we can pray. How to grow, truly understand the love of God himself. Because God is love and he abides in us. And if we really truly know and enjoy that love, the effect of it by uh, is that we can love others. It is realistic. It is concrete. And in that way, and in that way also we can understand also through this process again, sometimes uh, the difficulties come, not just the idea about, okay, I'm I'm, I should love others, but love this exactly this person <laughs> because it's quite specific. Maybe this person is, or maybe sometimes it happened in our life with, meet or find someone that is harder to love and in that way we can pray for that because we believe that God is love and he will enable us show and express that love of course the degree might be different it depends on the context but then it is possible not because what we are doing but what God are doing and continue doing in our life and as if we truly grow in this in this aspect and we enjoy it in this uh, abiding, in that way we can understand that this is the act of God in our life. This is God's work in our life. But truly, when we can love someone and we know that actually it's harder for us, but somehow we can eventually express that kind of care and love for him, even to the minimum for maybe just pray for him or her, it's also because God's love grow in us. And we need to pray for this. Because this is the commandment, it is not an easy thing to do, it's not something that ought automatically to do, but we can also pray for that. And to love, it is also interesting here to say that to love our brothers, sometimes people see that, oh, okay, this is about Christian love, we should just only love our brothers, and it means, of course, brothers and sisters in Christ. But I think uh, the uh, and, not, and not loving others, I mean non-Christian or whatever, but I believe as we understand this correctly, it is about uh, what is talking here about loving others, loving, uh, loving our brothers. It is about the minimum indicator. It is the minimum indicator how the love of God truly works in our life. Right? Because I, anyway, in other passages it's also clear that Jesus commands us to love, our, to love our enemy. And how do you compare this? So we can see that, um, or if I want to borrow from Luke's terminology, it's from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the end of the world. It's about growing. So how do we know I truly in, abides in God's love? How I truly know that God loved me and I love him? The minimum indicator that I can love my brothers. Simple, basic. I can love it to my brothers. I can show that love to my brothers, even again, through the difficulties, and there is a sense of loyalty, sacrificial and benefit, beneficial for him or her, of course. And as this thing grows, and then we can extend them to further people. To maybe, um, yeah, it, again, I'm borrowed uh, from Luke's terminology here. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end, to the end of the world. It's about something that close to us first. And then we extend it to the further group and father and even to the end of the world again this is something uh, this is indication of the growth and of course in the history is about the growth of the church start from jerusalem judea samaria to the end of the world but this is something we can also understand when we 
uh, want to learn how to love others, start by loving who, the one who is close to us. Starting by lo uh, show the, uh, the love to the one who, who is our family in Christ. Or maybe even our closest, our close family, right? And in that way, naturally, we, as we uh, grow in his love, we see that how he will enrich us and how this love of God will grow in our life and we can show it and extend it even to other people, even to our enemy, like the Samaritan here in the <laughs> terminology of Luke. And to the end of the world means maybe some people did with that that is foreign to us that are uh, maybe um, we didn't even think about. But then in such a way and in certain moment maybe in the context that we have, that give us the opportunity to show that love to them, maybe by preaching the gospel to them or taking care of them in their, when they have a certain needs. And as we exercise this and we do this, we understand that it is God who works in our life and use us in such a way for his glory. May we truly grow and understand the love of God. And yeah, we may we pray for this that we are longing for this to grow in our life as we follow him and has, as has been shown by his only beloved son because Jesus also died for his enemy. While we are still enemy, Jesus died for us. That's what Apostle Paul said. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that you remind us today about your love and we also want to pray, Lord, that we want to ask for your forgiveness, that sometimes we, not just sometimes, but many times we fail to show your love and we fail to recognize your love in our life. We also want to pray, Lord, that we, may your love grow in us, that we may understand your love according to your word and we may live and show that love to others, to the people nearby us, to the people surrounding us, and even to some other people that we don't know, that we didn't think about, but you want to use us to be your channel of your love to them also. Help us, Lord, and give us also the sensitivity and also wisdom to exercise and to grow in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.